change is coming to college athletics and that clock is ticking on the change becoming reality with six states name image and likeness laws going into effect july 1st here to discuss how we got here what this means for the immediate future of college sports including its arms race of recruiting i'm Corey mccartney joined by darren Hyder, sports entertainment and ip lawyer owner of the sports agent blog university of florida sports law instructor and an nil advocate darren welcome in and thanks for the time of course thanks for having me Absolutely. Now, as I mentioned, six states NIL law is taking effect July 1, uh, 15 other states to follow. Other states are in varying stages. Only Ohio and Wisconsin have yet to introduce a bill. Uh, while we're on the precipice of a new era in amateur sports here, and it's hard to shake the feeling of the Wild West in the current state-led guidelines with different parameters and start dates. Yeah, actually, let's let's start first with six states. I'm only aware of five. I know Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and New Mexico. So what would be the sixth? Tennessee, correct? Or is that, that one in 2022? So I think there's a little confusion about Tennessee. Initially, there were reports that it would be July 1 of this year. My understanding is that it's actually January 1 of 2022. That could change, as with everything, but that's my understanding. Okay, uh, but certainly there's this state-led uh, push at this point. Uh, does it feel like the Wild West to you? I mean, from the end of, of not having federal guidelines in place of how this should be approached? No, I wouldn't say it's the Wild West. It's certainly, this is a problem, if you'd like to call it a problem, that is a, uh, a conclusion or a consequence of the NCAA's inaction on the subject. Uh, I don't know exactly what the NCA was envisioning would happen, but I think this was clearly what the result was going to be. If you go back to 2019, California being the first state to pass legislation on name, image, and likeness, albeit with an effective date of 2023, Colorado then begins discussing its own legislation. And here in the state of Florida, we start our own conversations. And it began with Representative Chip Lamarca, who represents my district in South Florida, and his legislative aide, Corey Stanisia, who approached me back, I think it was September, October of 2019, asking me to be involved in this process of developing legislation, promoting it, and determining what terms we should use, what were the best parts of the California legislation, and what were areas that we could improve upon. And one of the key areas that we really did a deep dive on was the effective date in California of 2023 and whether we could push it up to 2021 or even earlier. In fact, the first piece of legislation that we crafted had an effective date of July 1, 2020. Hmm. And then after it went through the House in the state of Florida and went to the Senate, there were debates surrounding that effective date and whether that was too soon. Ultimately, there was a, an agreement between the House and the Senate to use July 1, 2021. And then as we've talked about already, other states have followed. I don't think that there's this anarchy that's been created. In fact, I've started to analyze the bills and laws as compared to each other, and there's very small distinctions between them. I think really where the potential anarchy exists, if you want to call it that, is between the states that that will have laws effective July 1 of this year and those that don't. And so I think that we will see the NCA do something to bridge that gap, at least temporarily, until the federal government takes action on this issue. It's very clear that Congress will do something. It's less than a 50% likelihood from the people I've spoken with this week that it occurs prior to July 1, but anything is possible. Uh, here in Georgia, there's a revenue sharing model in Bill 617, student athletes putting 75% into a pool that's redistributed, can't be tested until a year removed from school or uh, after graduation since signed, Georgia, Georgia Tech, Georgia State have said they are against a sharing model. Uh, what obstacles do you see for there being schools who maybe negate what their states are, are asking of them? So what's interesting about the Georgia legislation is that pooling arrangement that you mentioned. And I've tried hard to understand why it was inserted in the first place. It seems to be anti-conservative, which you've had the conservative lawmakers who propose the legislation by and large and a conservative governor, from my understanding. So it was very surprising that that type of language was put in. And I don't know where it came from, who developed it and who came up with that concept. 
That said, as you've mentioned, all the major schools in the state have already come out and said that they will not be utilizing this particular provision. And I think that's very wise of them because they'd be putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage as compared to the other states that have passed such legislation. But to be clear, this is not the, the schools violating the law in any way. The pooling arrangement in the Georgia law only gave the schools the opportunity to provide these types of pooling arrangements. I do not expect to see any schools in the state of Georgia nor in the other states that have passed this legislation to tacitly violate the laws that have been created on this subject because there will be consequences of doing so. So just to be crystal clear, the fact that the schools in Georgia aren't going to be following this pooling policy does not mean that they're violating the law in any respect whatsoever. Uh, we mentioned a little bit there, but there have been calls from NCAA President Mark Emmert urging for federal assistance creating NIL laws. Uh, word is that this week's NCAA council meetings will not, uh, they will not be formalizing any legislation. From your standpoint, though, the NCAA even asking for the federal government to provide help, what does that create uh, when you think about the Supreme Court still having to rule on NCAA versus Alston? Good question. I think a lot of people have gotten caught up on the fact that there is a pending case in front of the Supreme Court where there has already been oral arguments and we're all waiting on a decision of the highest court in the land in this case of NCA v. Alston. And it's suggested that a decision could come out either later in May or at some point in time in June. Perhaps it even goes into July, but that's not likely. It's more likely that something comes out late May or in June. But I think what's important is to understand the distinction between NCA v. Alston and what we're talking about with name, image, and likeness. First and foremost, the Supreme Court is not tasked whatsoever with providing any opinion on name, image, and likeness in NCA v. Alston. In fact, I would be very surprised to see in a, a well-reasoned opinion include any mention whatsoever of name, image, and likeness, perhaps in the dicta, but not in the actual holding. What NCA v. Alston is about is really putting caps on a specific form of benefit to the athletes. And it was changed from the very beginning when the case was initiated at the district court level to now being strictly about educational related benefits and whether there can be a cap on them. Again, this is an antitrust related issue and not a name, image, and likeness issue. What we're talking about with name, image, and likeness and publicity rights is strictly allowing athletes to make money outside of the university, to engage in contract with third parties for endorsement opportunities, license their name, image, and likeness, create football, basketball camps, create their own businesses. But that has nothing to do with the schools actually providing benefits to the athletes, which really is what NCA v. Alston is about. To an extent, there's concerns from the NCA's perspective with regard to antitrust, both from the educational related benefits perspective, as well as from the name, image, and likeness perspective, to the extent that the NCA, the conferences, or the schools seek to restrict the name, image, and likeness opportunities of the athletes. And if you look at the legislation that has been passed state to state, it's pretty clear that the states do not want the conferences, the NCA, or the schools to interfere unless there, there are very specific uh, exceptions to that. Schools can get in the way if there's a conflict with their existing terms with competing companies, Sometimes if it goes against the, the morals and values of the schools, and certainly there will be categories like pornographic companies, alcohol beverage companies, et cetera, that will be off limits. I mean, even though it's not directly tied to name, image, and likeness, I think even back with NCAA versus Alston to uh, Ed O'Bannon's case, and, I, and obviously he's filing suit against the NCAA and collegiate licensing and company alleging violations of the Sherman Act, in essence, depriving him of his right of publicity. Uh, obviously, the Alston case has come after that. What do you believe, though, has been that fundamental change where we're seeing the highest court in the land uh, hearing a case again about amateurism and the fact that we're just kind of viewing that in a different way and understanding the big business of college athletics and how this factors in? Yeah, I actually think it was somewhat surprising that the Supreme Court decided to take up this case. The vast majority of cases that are petitioned to the Supreme Court are just outright rejected. Uh, less than 10% of the cases that are petitioned to the, to the highest court are accepted. 
to be heard. So I think just with that stat alone, the likelihood of it being accepted was, was very minuscule. Uh, separately, you typically find cases going to the Supreme Court where there's divergence among the different districts, among the different courts of appeal in the United States. And you don't have so much divergence here. A lot of the cases emanating against the NCA are originating out on the West Coast in the Ninth Circuit in California, talking about Ed O'Bannon, um, Alston, et cetera. So you don't have that here either. So I think it's really interesting. I guess what, what it's signaling is that the Supreme Court is very interested in what the NCA is doing. And if you listen to the oral arguments from uh, the hearing with regard to NCAB Alston, you would have heard justices Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Thomas, et cetera, call out the NCAA, say amateurism has changed, talking about the major coach salaries that are being received, yet the athletes aren't receiving much more if, if uh, cost of attendance and scholarships. Um, and, and so I guess it's just an issue that a lot of these justices felt compelled to take up and um, you know, we haven't seen the Supreme Court weigh in on, on the NCA in many years. So everyone's paying attention to NCA v. Alston as they should. I just wonder whether they're conflating the issues on, on Alston with what's happening in name, image, and likeness. And I don't expect the large explosion that some others do with regard to name, image, and likeness based on the decision that's, that's forthcoming. As you mentioned, uh, there is a this desire, this desire for the you know the, the federal government to step in, have its own uh, approach to how this should go. The NCAA is obviously looking for that, but as it currently stands, I mean the state's laws run counter to what the NCAA is currently enforcing. Uh, I know there's obviously a want and desire for for change on all sides, but is there the potential for, uh, from your perspective for backlash for these states as the respective schools kind of jump the gun before there's in, any NCAA guidelines? I don't expect that. I know there's been a lot of questions surrounding this and assumptions being made that if nothing happens at the federal level by July 1, the NCA is just going to file suit against the states that have effective dates of July 1, that being Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, New Mexico. Uh, but if you Read what Mark Emmert has recently said to a variety of college athletes and more recently to lawmakers in the state of Florida. He has come out and said that there will not be punitive action taken by the NCAA against athletes in those states, nor against schools in those states. And schools are put in a very tough position because if the NCAA would take a different stance, then the schools would have to make a determination as to whether or not they're going to listen to the NCAA or follow the statutes within their own states. And you would think that the schools are going to follow those statutes. What's really interesting about all of this is near the end of the Florida's legislative session at the end of April, the very last days, an amendment was snuck into a bill to actually push back the effective date from July 1, 2021 to July 1, 2022. And there was a big uproar based on that amendment that was snuck into a charter schools bill. Within two days, in fact, on the very last day of the legislative session, another amendment was added to a different piece of legislation to again, move back the effective date to July 1, 2021. And at the same time, there was a lot of discussion and concern among lawmakers about what happens if the NCA does in fact take punitive action. And there was an, a separate amendment that was passed that seems to indicate the schools would have to pull out of the NCAA. Imagine an NCAA of 49 states without the state of Florida that has FSU, University of Florida, University of Miami, FAU, FIU, et cetera. It would be devastating. And so the NCAA, I think, is put now in a very precarious position. Again, a byproduct of its own inaction. But I don't think that it can take punitive action, even if we were to ignore the statements that Mark Emmert has already said in the recent past. From what your current understanding is, I mean, let's say you're a notable player at a, at a money-making school, a uh, power five program, who dictates uh, who you can do business with? I mean, can a school control opportunities? I mean, what if there's conflicting, uh, you know, deals between a school and a player? I mean, I sort of think about Trevor Lawrence, right? The number one pick in the NFL draft signs with Adidas before the draft, but he's coming from a Clemson, uh, which is a Nike school. H how are those relationships going to be determined? And how do we know about how this is supposed to work? 
So it's vitally important for everyone to pay very close attention to the specific language in each state law. And again, there are variances by and between the individual states. So I very strongly implore any athlete, any agent, anyone who, in, who intends to be involved in this business to review the specific state laws that have been passed and will go effective July 1. But if you look at each of those laws, one thing that is common is that prior to any deal between an athlete and a brand becoming effective, the agreement has to be processed with the athlete's university. And what the athlete's university is going to do, first and foremost, is look at the specific terms in that deal between the athlete and the brand and compare those terms to the terms that the university has with the potentially competing brand. So in, in your specific example, if Trevor Lawrence wanted to engage with Adidas while he was in school, assuming that this law was effective back then, the university would have to look at the specific terms, not whether or not Adidas is in conflict as a whole with its partner, but whether the terms conflict. So to the extent that let's say Adidas merely wanted Trevor Lawrence to post certain things on his Instagram account, and it did not interfere strictly with the terms of Clemson's deal, that would likely be permissible. So we may see instances where athletes will endorse certain brands that are competing with brands of the university. Another example could be at the University of Florida. It's a Jordan brand school. There's the possibility that an athlete promotes Puma, Adidas, as you've mentioned, or any other brand. So there is potential for that. Before the law is going to affect in July 1st, June 1st, the recruiting dead period is going to be lifted. Uh, it's, it's going to allow coaches to go back to their normal uh, recruiting calendars. Kind of an interesting uh, factor there. I mean, these laws are going to be kind of hanging there in the balance. Uh, we know it's going to be level playing ground for a lot of the 20, class of 2022 kids. They won't be on campus before these laws go into effect. But uh, one player in particular, uh, not to necessarily single anybody out, but there's a, a defensive end in Washington named JT Tumalu, number six player in the nation. He's looking at a number of power five programs in Alabama, Ohio State, USC, Washington, uh, or among those schools. Alabama, California, though, the only school uh, state's among the ones he's looking at that have a law that will go into effect in July one, how much do you see just that opportunity for a player kind of factoring into decision makings? And does that become part of a school's pitch, uh, what their state and what their school potentially offers in terms of uh, name, image, and likeness opportunities? Well, going with your second question first, it's absolutely a major element of schools pitches currently. And we're not only seeing it from the universities and states with the July 1, 2021 effective date, we're also seeing it from schools in other states, but they're saying to the athletes, don't really get sidetracked by the fact that five states have passed laws. We're going to have something, even though that does require quite a bit of speculation and assuming that the schools are accurate because there's really nothing to rely upon other than those statements. I mean, you really have to look at the laws themselves, but yes, every school is absolutely using name, image, and likeness in an effort to recruit today and have been for quite some time. But going back to your first question, yes, it's becoming a huge factor in the players and their families' decision-making process. But you mentioned California and Alabama, in my mind, they are not on the same playing field. California was a first mover, but it still has an effective date of 2023. So if an athlete is enrolling at a California institution now, unless something changes, and it may, that athlete has to wait a few years before he or she is able to make to benefit off of his or her name, image, and likeness. Whereas that athlete is absolutely certain that as of July 1, he will be able to make money at an Alabama institution. So it's really interesting that California was a first mover, but really is not in the discussion with regard to the schools that are being looked at primarily by the blue chip recruits. Well, pressure is mounting for the NCAA and it's pushed for federal legislation, but very soon college sports are about to look very, very different as athletes take on a new level of control over how their individual brand is used. He is Darren Heidner on Instagram and Twitter at Darren Heitner, and you can find him at darrenheitner.com. Darren, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.